Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us back to the Russian Far East, to a district known as Pozharsky District. The town of Luchigorsk is remote and surrounded by wilderness. The terrain is remote and rugged mountains that extend for hundreds of miles to the east of nearly uninterrupted wilderness. Forests of birch, juniper, maple, and yew trees stand above a lower canopy of Japanese alder, chosenia willow, and various subspecies of wild grape, kiwi, and berry bushes. Common animals in the area include wild boar, musk deer, roe deer, sika deer, and a unique and endangered critter called the long-tailed goral. The predators of this area are a murderer's row of powerful and dangerous animals and include wolves, the Amur leopard, the Usuri brown bear, the Amur tiger, Usuri black bear, and the Eurasian lynx, just to name a few. Each bear species in this location have plenty to feed on, between seasonal salmon runs, an abundance of wild berries, and plentiful game animals. Bears also eat pine nuts, wild walnuts, and acorns, which provide a late summer fat source in their diet. Around the town of Luchigorsk, there has been an uptick in temperature recorded over the last few decades which affects berry and salmon seasons. If temperatures are too high, then berries shorten their season and the fruit rots more quickly than in colder seasons. The salmon are affected by warmer water temperatures in the streams and rivers, which can cause them to avoid spawning altogether in warmer years. When several of these factors coincide, bears in the area begin to look for human populations to make up the difference in their diets. On the morning of August 20th of 2015, Nikolai decided to take his cat out for a walk. He was an elderly pensioner who lived in a large apartment complex in the town of only 21,000 residents. He sat down near one of his neighbors on a wooden bench along a man-made lake designed to hold wastewater from a local thermal plant. Along the edge of the lake grow a dense layer of reeds that nearly completely hide the lake from view. As Nikolai sat on the bench, an Asiatic black bear emerged from them, then bounded toward town. As Nikolai and his neighbor stood for a better view of the bear, it stopped and peered back in their direction. The presence of the humans apparently made the bear uneasy, and it turned around and headed back toward the shelter and privacy of the reeds. Suddenly, area dogs began to bark intensely. Nikolai turned around to see another Asiatic black bear trotting down the sidewalk along the other edge of his apartment complex. Wondering how the bear got so far away so fast, it wasn't long before he realized that this bear was a second bear. That is when Nikolai and his neighbor decided to head back into the safety of their apartment complex. As the other two men entered the complex, Victor Dubitsky was exiting through another door to take his dog for a walk. As soon as he left the building, he was overwhelmed with the sensation of something being amiss. As he turned around, he was met by the larger Asiatic black bear already flying through the air toward him. Dubitsky was quickly taken down by the bear and it wasted no time in swatting him across his throat with its claws. Dubitsky raised his arm to his face to ward off the bear attack as it clamped its jaws onto his forearm. A boisterous crowd soon began yelling at the bear and trying to drive it off as it attacked Dubitsky. The bear then drove its claws into the tissues on the inside of his thigh. A searing pain shot through his body, causing him to lose consciousness immediately. With Dubitsky now unconscious on the ground, a taxicab pulled up and the driver laid on the horn. Hearing this loud intrusion into its meal, the bear turned tail and bolted from the scene. The bystanders and witnesses to the attack rushed to Dubitsky's side and began assessing his wounds. An amazing scene of caring and support unfolded as the occupants of the apartment building began dropping bandages, first aid kits, and rubbing alcohol from their balconies. An ambulance was summoned and arrived around the same time as the local game officer. As first responders began to treat Dubitsky's injuries, Anatoly Tarasenko began to assess what led to the bear attack. As a game and resource officer, his main job is to head off illegal lumber and animal poaching. The lumber poachers of the area illegally harvested valuable wood such as Mongolian oak and Manchurian linden as well as various animals to supplement their income, and this practice has led to broad clear-cuts on the mountains around the town. 
As if this was not a demanding enough workload, he also responded to the presence of wild animals in town. The spry and strong-built 60-year-old immediately ordered a police blockade near the apartment building and requested the help of his 28-year-old assistant, Yaroslav Shishkin. The two men arranged to have hounds brought in to search for the bear in the reeds and drive them from town. Just as they had established their plan to canvass the reeds, Anatoly's cell phone rang and another report of an incident split his attention. Anatoly listened as the details of the report were relayed to him. A few blocks away and across town, a man had stepped into some bushes to answer nature's call. As he emptied his bladder, an enormous brown bear approached him and swatted at him. He managed to flee before the bear could get a hold of him and lost sight of the bear as he did so. Reports began to trickle in that lifeguards at the beach on the lake had seen a bear swimming across while a cub rode on its back. Anatoly connected the dots and figured that Dubitsky had run into the sow after she emerged from the lake. He determined that the sow and cub must have been separated due to the bustle and noise of the town they entered confusing them, and knew this scenario was very dangerous to the townsfolk and the bears. He immediately put in a request to shoot the bear on sight to head off another attack on a human. After the shoot on sight command was approved on August 21st, Luchagorsk lit up with reports of bears entering the town. There were reports of bear sightings around the coal mine near town and the power plant as well as near summer homes and private apiaries used to produce honey. Bears were reported raiding dumpsters and gardens near dwellings, and the reports only increased over the next several days. Each day that followed added another ten bears who were encroaching on the town and its residents. Just outside of town, long lines of bears began forming as they followed each other toward whatever offerings the town might bring them. It was as if they had all honed in on the people of the town and now were planning on finding what they needed in an area they had previously avoided. The residents of Nikolai's apartment building would sit on their balconies and watch as bear after bear swam across the lake and wearily pulled themselves ashore. Residents began to report the bears appearing in their basements and even walking down sidewalks in the middle of town. By the end of the month, the town was overrun with bears. Anatoly and the other game officers were at a loss trying to figure out how best to handle the situation. Nikolai Agapov served as a district inspector for the nearby Land of the Leopard National Park. Given there are no bear experts in Primorsky Krai, he gathered information regarding bear behavior from local hunters and game officers. They told him that bears would routinely raid honeymead stores of locals and behaved like drunks, wrecking everything they could reach and generally making a mess. Other reports indicated more endearing traits like a sow bear returning to the skin of one of her deceased cubs as it decayed as if mourning her lost baby. Agapov and Anatoly quickly discovered that every natural food source for the bear had catastrophically failed in 2015. Bear populations had significantly increased in prior years due to an abundance of food causing a collapse of their food sources. This forced a mass migration of black and brown bears that for some reason focused its route toward Luchigorsk. Bears are known to vividly remember where they locate food and even the scent of food during their travels. Now they were using this information to seek out food to prepare them for hibernation. They were underweight and in no condition to hibernate which would cause a prolonged problem for the towns in the area, as bears who do not hibernate are extremely dangerous due to hunger. This situation left local authorities with three avenues of protecting the residents of the town. They could launch a hazing program designed to drive the bears away from town or could provide another source of food outside the city boundaries to keep them from entering. The last solution they had at their disposal was to start killing the bears to bring their numbers back into a sustainable balance. They knew that once the bears decided that people were fair game, then attacks would increase and people would die. Anatoly put together a response team of 14 members to react to bear sightings. Each member was a local hunter, a game officer, or other men experienced with bears. They worked in shifts, answered calls from residents, and responded to diffuse situations. They blocked manholes and basement accesses across the city to keep bears from hiding there and circulated information pamphlets to residents on what to do when they ran into a bear. Gone, at least for now, were the days when parents would allow their children to walk to school by themselves. They accompanied their kids everywhere they went as much as possible. 
Police cars blared their sirens while driving around town to drive the bears out, and fire trucks sprayed down the reeds around the lake to limit cover for the bears. On August 26th at around 9 p.m., one of the response team's members, named Alexander Zhdanov, was relaxing after a day's work of driving the coal delivery train at the mine. He is an avid hunter and snowboarder and had just finished dinner. He was checking in on his social media account when his phone rang with a report of a bear incident demanding his attention. Apparently, two bears had been spotted in town and an officer responded to the location. He had wounded one of the bears with his service pistol, and the bears had fled afterward. This meant there was a wounded and desperate bear prowling the streets of his town. He grabbed his Saiga hunting rifle and headed toward the location as quickly as he could. Zhdanov jumped into the police van and the group began to scan the shadows of the evening looking for the bears. Suddenly a group of people ran from the old park area, screaming in terror. The shadowy outline of an enormous bear burst onto the sidewalk and Zhdanov immediately bailed from the van and pursued the bear on foot. As he walked, the headlamps of the police car were used to light up the night. Zhdanov yelled bear warnings as he walked through the streets in an attempt to alert anyone still outside. The injured bear limped and moaned its way through the neighborhood with Zhdanov and the police in close pursuit. It fled into a playground area between residential homes and out of view of the pursuing response team. As Zhdanov worried about the possibility of hitting a resident with any shot he may need to take, he walked right up to the crouched bear. Zhdanov quickly shouldered his rifle and fired twice, knocking the bear backward. The bear moaned in pain as it was now paralyzed. It raked its claws on the sidewalk, trying to retreat from the confusion and violence the city presented it. Residents poured from the doors of houses and drivers lit up the bear as it lay on the sidewalk, moaning and whining. Ten minutes later, the bear succumbed to its injuries, and it died having not injured nor harmed any of the residents. Still searching for insight into the bear invasion, the carcass of the bear was taken and a necropsy was performed. The bear was found to be a four-year-old sow and undersized for its age. This was likely due to diminished food for this year, which was one of its pivotal years for development. It had cubs because they could see it was lactating, but her cubs had not been located. This bear fit the description and size of the bear that had attacked Dubitsky. Anatoly surmised this was the sow bear who was searching for her cub and that she had never found it. A few days later, a drowned cub was discovered on the shore of the lake and the mystery had seemingly been solved. By mid-September, the residents had decided the bears were not going to leave. This was a short-term boon for local taxi drivers as few residents would walk the bear-infested streets at risk of their safety. Local teens began to dare each other to go bear spotting at night for thrills. The locals would drive their cars up and illuminate the dumpsters of the area to film the bears like it was a new form of entertainment. On the outskirts of town, armed beekeepers would patrol their apiaries toward off invasions for bears seeking the honey inside. They began by firing warning shots, but the bears were so accustomed to people that nothing would frighten them away. Eventually, the bears were simply shot and left where they fell. Zhdanov approximated that 100 bears were killed in this manner without notifying any authorities. That fall in Primorsky Krai, there were 60 documented incidents of bears entering villages with 18 bear conflicts reported. There were a handful of human deaths due to bear attacks and numerous other hunters, children and elderly people were injured by the bears. Anatoly was torn between the dilemma of residents following the hunters and taking pictures while they chased away or killed interloping bears and filled with joy by seeing the Asiatic black bears in such numbers. The species was recovering and their presence was proof. Nearby the large city of Khabarovsk, with its population of 550,000 people, a pregnant woman was attacked by a bear as the problem spread from Luchigorsk to other areas. Reports indicated that the pregnant woman saved her own life by biting the bear back, forcing its retreat. Four bears had been shot in her small village while three others were hit by cars. Bears in the area had become so hungry that they were seen digging up graves in the cemetery to feed on the corpses of the dead. The invasion of the starving bears had begun to sway public opinion among the residents of villages in the area. One Sunday, 54-year-old Yuri Kolpak was called to respond to a report of a bear in an apartment building basement. 
Yuri was charged with wildlife protection for the entire region and had shown up in response to the report when about 200 residents began to gather. They asked him if there was any way the bear could simply be tranquilized and removed from the basement to be released elsewhere. When he responded that there was no way this could happen because they couldn't tell how much sedative to put in the dart for an animal of unknown size, and the bear could do a lot of damage to anyone around, in the ten minutes it took for the drug to take effect, the residents began calling him a murderer from their elevated balconies. Yuri was apparently comedic in his address to the crowd as he asked for volunteers to go with him and sing the bear lullabies. Yuri finally mustered the bravery to enter the basement alone, with the bear. The bear chuffed and tried to run Yuri off, but in the flicker of his flashlight Yuri fired and ended the bear's life. The residents were angry at him but didn't appreciate the danger the presence of the bear presented to them and their loved ones. Yuri posted warnings on how to avoid the necessity of another bear being shot. He instructed the residents to remove their vegetables from their gardens and gather all the fruit that had fallen on the ground to avoid attracting another bear to their apartment building. He educated the residents that bears who find fruit rotting on the ground will wander long distances to return to the location after being darted and removed to the taiga. Yuri was quick to flash photos of a bear that had killed a fisherman earlier in the year. The bear had decapitated the fisherman as well as dismembered him, this did little to dissuade the residents' sentiments of tolerance toward the bears. The bear response team found themselves facing outrage and public backlash from the necessity of shooting bears right in front of people. The residents began to second-guess the policy of shooting the bears and wondered if the bear killings weren't just part of some overprotective bloodlust from the bear response teams. Conspiracy theories and alternative narratives began to fill the minds of the residents of the area fed by people who didn't want any of the bears killed. The members of the bear response team quickly arrived at the source of the dilemma. Many of the bears invading the town were rare Asiatic black bears and were very cute and more diminutive than the obviously dangerous giant brown bears so common in the area. They began to be filled with regret at having to do their jobs of protecting people who frequently didn't understand the danger the bears brought with each appearance. The locals began to be split in opinion on how to handle the bear crisis. With so many adult bears being shot, orphaned cubs were now roaming the streets as well. They were undoubtedly being familiarized with humans and that would not bode well for their independent lives as adults. Many of the orphaned cubs were delivered to the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center in the neighboring town of Utios. The center was founded by a man named Vladimir Krugloff, who had hogtied some 40 captured tigers by hand himself. The center eventually reared and released 300 orphaned cubs in preceding years. By October, a lone cub was located on the edge of Luchigorsk. It was seemingly orphaned and scared. A local media member began leaving it food as the response team waited three weeks for the needed paperwork to permit its capture. A few of the local school children were invited to film the capture of the cub by the media member and raced ahead to the tree the cub was hiding in. Members of the response team eventually caught the Asiatic black bear cub and brought her safely to a holding pen for transport soon thereafter. Unbeknownst to the men, someone had shot and wounded the cub with a rubber bullet, trying to haze it away from the area. She passed away that evening. Immediately after the death of the cub, the bears around Luchigorsk disappeared. They were no longer in the reeds or raiding dumpsters in town. They had simply vanished, even quicker than they had appeared. Experts stated that the bears had made their way back up to the wilderness to hibernate, but that many of them would not make it through the winter in the condition they were in. This would bring the elevated populations down and back into balance, as tragic and harsh as the facts were. Asiatic black bear populations are rebounding and the species numbers are stabilizing at healthy thresholds. The brown bears of the area are just as abundant as ever as things have returned to normal in the town of Luchigorsk, with the bears living in the forest and the humans safely in their towns. After reviewing the sad and tragic details of this incident, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think that preservation efforts had created a spike in bear populations that the local habitat could not sustain? Do you think the orphaned cubs will be able to be rehabilitated? What do you think could have been done better to have the bears away from Luchigorsk? 
Why do you think the public sentiment turned against the bear response teams? I will enjoy reading and replying to your thoughts, so post them in the comment section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. It will help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country. I would like to thank our Patreons, Camilla Golubewski, Randy Smith, Jill Noeski, Barry G. Logger, Andre Hines, Stephen Bruhl, Katrina Purifoy, Jenny Underwood, Patricia Ann Haney, Robbie Wade, Roger McKee, Julie Kimberly Bean, Mary Bradford, Guntucky Rasmus, L.A. on Fort Dicking, Paul Wincoop, David Veda Jr., Eleanor Hardy, Patricia Hermanowski Toussaint, Angela Hammett, Marvin Alexander, Pam Stevens, Lulu, 0000, Splash Log, Trevor Hannon, Jesse J. Driss, Janelle Holly, Omar De Leon, C.J. Avant, Kathy Ashuri, Diane Collier, Sandy Nielsen, Justin Land, Stephen Earl Smith, Stephen McLaughlin, A.J. Miller, Homa Masters, Ricky Helms, David Atkins, Shoulders, Repeat, Gerald Purcell, Dan Kemp, C.C.N.C., Alan LaFromboise, Regina Gilreath, Ballard, Sheldon Lewis, Sheila Baker, Carl Childers, Dion Lynch, Debbie Hannanen, H.T.D., 4-Life Biotoxic Beast, Gary Eric Sealrose, Victor Senkyu, Abhishek Bunia, Tracy Green, Young Games 34, Underscore, Nina Allison, Heather Lee, Duran Terrell, Matt Mochi, Connor Lavin, Stephen Wilkinson, Werner Voss, Ellie Justin Curry, Susan Holt, Butterfield, Sebastian Kelak, Brandon Wizardwood, Nicole N. Angel Barnhill, Joey Pinter, Morrow, Padano, Bubri, TJ Schools, Katie V. Wright, Gary Hyland, Cody Love, Katsy Murphy, Andrews, Matt Bagney, Lindy, Don Alejandro, Figueroa, Ian Romalor, Darcio Pacifico, Rose H. Lori McKay, Melissa Gottlieb, Megan Trend, Nathan P. Dina White, Cole Rodriguez, Aurora April, Donovan, Ryan Cernicky, Chris Marler, Wayne Washington, Fluffy Feet, Cheyenne Greg Schaefer, April Donovan, and Drone Adventures. Your support means the world to me.